Hello, everyone. Dr. Cindy Leibert here, and welcome to the Joy Prescription Podcast. I am delighted to introduce our special guest today, Angie Bowman. Angie is a pastor, Bible teacher, author, podcaster, founder of Steady On Ministries, and creator of the Step-by-Step Bible Study Method. We're thrilled to have you here, Angie. How are you today? I am well, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. Excellent. And I know you're tuning in from Southern Illinois, and that's actually where I grew up. So how how are things in that area? Well, it's when we're recording this, it's springtime. Springtime has just started. And so it's the crazy Southern Illinois weather where it is snowing and then raining, and then you wear shorts and then you have on your parka and then you <laughs> so, <I remember>. so, <laughs> the spring, the spring is coming, but winter is having a hard time yielding. So, but, but it's uh yeah, but it's beautiful. And I take advantage of the days I can get outside and take a walk. So. Well, it, the weather's kind of Capricious here as well. We have uh, parka days and then sunshiny. And actually, I got hot over the weekend and had to put some shorts on. So, <laughs> so Angie, you are passionate about teaching the Bible and have been serving in the local church since your teenage years. Is that right? Yes, I, I have. I've been a pastor, a local church pastor since 2004, so almost 20 okay. years but Fantastic. I've been in some kind of leadership, really uh, teaching or worship leading or youth ministry or uh, adult Sunday school and all of that since, yeah, since I was in high school. Wow. And you're a preacher's kid. Is that right? A PK? Yes, ma'am. I grew up a PK. <laughs> I, I think my, I think I was born on a Monday. I was in church the following Sunday and I haven't missed very many in between. Um, I, you know, I have one of the sweetest my upbringing was not easy, but my church upbringing, my faith upbringing has always been sweet and secure. Mm-hmm. And so, which I think has helped me so much through some of the things that have not been easy in my life, that church has always been a safe place, not the people always, I will say I've had my share of church hurt. Most of us has, have experienced church hurt. Sure. So the faith community has not always been a safe, secure place, but the idea that Jesus is there has always Mm -hmm. been something that I knew and that I knew I belonged there. And I knew I had to keep trying, uh, finding the right group of people that I could Mm -hmm. worship and serve and experience and grow in my relationship with Jesus. You know, that's beautiful. Tell us us about the steady on Mm -hmm. ministries and how that was birthed. Yeah, well, Steady On is in year six now, which I I find very hard to believe, but it was actually birthed after a, a several years after a traumatic car crash that my family and I were in, we were in a head on car crash. And I was hospitalized for a long time, multiple surgeries, a lot of therapy. It was a season of physical brokenness. But in that season of physical brokenness, the Lord really began to work on some of the emotional heartbrokenness that I had that was just buried deep. And I had tried to work around for by that point, about two decades happened in my teenage years. I was abused by a teacher in the high school that I attended and he was a child predator, but he was also a beloved a sort of pillar of that school and that community. And the, when I came forward with my story, the town chose the school, the town chose to believe his version of the story and rejected mine. And it was a very public, very traumatic, very shaming situation, mm-hmm. a social death, sometimes I say, and mm-hmm. I was as alone as I ever hoped to be. I did not have a faith community that supported me. I didn't have a school. I didn't have friends. The relationship had gone on about nine months and he, as an abuser does, he isolated me very much from friends and peers. And so I left that town very much alone. I was 16 when that happened. Maybe I said that already, but, um, my family didn't talk about it. Uh, it wasn't something that we really were able to process very much at all. And so I felt like, I had an asterisk by my name that this had happened Mm -hmm. to me and it negated my call to ministry, that it negated my ability to be good. And so I began a process of just like working around it and focusing on productivity. I couldn't be good. So I would do good. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. when we had that crash and I couldn't do anything, 
I sort of stood at a crossroads and the Lord invited me to see him and my life in a very different way. It did not happen quickly, but he brought just deep, intense healing and discovery and self-awareness. And so that's a long answer, but it was a, (laughs) it was a precious process. And from really being able to understand what it means to believe the promises of God, to live by those promises and use them to speak to the lies of the enemy that will tell you you're not good. So you have to do good or all kinds, you know, uh, whatever, however that form takes in our individual lives, speaking, knowing the promises and speaking them to those lies became such an essential part of my faith journey. And that's where steady on came from that we can continue to take steps forward, steady steps forward. It's based on Psalm 40 verse two in the NLT that says, um, he set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. And he mm-hmm. does, he steadies us. I do not walk steadily. Mm-hmm. I slip, <laughs> but I do not worry that I'm going to fall and stay down anymore yeah. because I, I know which hand to hold. And so again, that's kind of a long answer to that question, but that is where the ministry comes from and the foundation on which it's built. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you for sharing your story. Yeah. And Jean, yes. powerful. Yeah. Yes. And I love that you um, can see that invitation from the Lord through your experience. I love that you chose that word because um, that truly is what happens when we go through hard things. The Lord invites us into a deeper place of, like you said, experiencing him in a way we haven't before or experiencing a promise that we've yet to apprehend in our lives. So that's so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. It was important. We know it had to be a choice. I, you know, I would never Mm -hmm. have thought in the ashes of all that came crashing down uh, that summer day that I would look back some 12, almost 13 years later now and say that crash was one of the most important blessings that the Mm -hmm. Lord has ever brought in. And I'm not, we lost things and it was really hard. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that it's all good. And then I have, you know, but I do see when we give him even the things that we think, I don't even know how I got here. I don't know why you allowed this to happen. I don't know how anything good, you know, even those things, when we will hear his invitation to surrender them to him, he really does work all things together for good. It's a promise and he does do it. Yes. Amen. That is so true. Well, I want to hear a little bit about your step-by-step Bible study method that you've created. Tell us about that and how it's unique. Thank you. Yeah. So it's a five-step process. I am trained in inductive Bible study through precept ministry. I don't know if you guys are familiar with precept. Yeah. And I taught classes for years with precept, loved studying that way. Um, But one of the things that I heard a lot that people would say to me is I would love to study the Bible this way, but I don't have the know-how. I don't have the resources or I don't have the time because Mm -hmm. intense Bible studies like that, you know, kind of do ask a lot of us and signing up for 16 weeks on five verses for five chapters in James was something that people couldn't do sometimes, right? Because those studies are long and we go deep and, you know, we stay in there. And so I really felt like there was a pain point there, if you will, where people want to be able to get into the word and study, but they really lack this, the resources or the skills or, and here's another thing. We depend too much on the Bible teachers to have the answers. And that breaks my heart because I love Bible teachers. I'm a Bible teacher, (laughs) but the thing that I know is true is I can tell you what the Bible and spending time in the Bible said to me but I cannot tell you what spending time in the Bible says to you. And so more than teaching people the Bible, I have such a desire to help people have confidence that they can get in the Bible on their own. And so it is a five-step process. We use one verse of scripture, and then we focus on one word in that verse of scripture to find life application. We compare the word in other translations. We look at the original word. We read a little commentary to get to context. And then we look for the characteristics of God in the verse. We look Mm -hmm. for the lie of the enemy in the verse and we do a takeaway from the verse. So yeah, we teach it often in the steady on community. I have a teaching team of about 20 ladies. We have a Facebook live every Tuesday night. We pick a verse of the week. We study it all week. So it's a big part of what the ministry does. I Um, love that. That is awesome. I'm so excited for you. I put a plug. I have a free masterclass. If anybody would like to, (laughs) I will, I will make sure you ladies have the link if you don't mind. And I will just, I'll put it here. And if anybody wants to explore it, it is free. So 
Excellent. Oh, thank yeah. you so much, Angie. That sounds very mm-hmm. appealing to me as well. I I also looked into K. Arthur's inductive Bible study and, and experienced those same barriers. So maybe yeah. in a different season of my mm-hmm. life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, and wanted just to tag on to that, a lot of the ladies that were in my Bible study class, men too, but mostly male ladies were in a empty nest season of their life. That's when they had time uh, mm-hmm. to devote to it. And so it was, uh, it was a lot of people in that season of the life and the, and the thing, and I don't, I, I loved those ladies. I'm nothing. That's so great. Get in the word. But the one thing that I heard over and over again was if I had known how to do this earlier in my life, it mm-hmm. might've made a difference in my marriage. It might've made mm-hmm. a difference in my parenting. It might've made it. And, and I felt that grief also, even though there was joy in getting in the word then, I felt the grief of feeling like, dang, I wish I had done this earlier. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. That's so awesome that you are helping uh, fill that gap for people. And I, I love your heart behind getting people in the word themselves, because that is truly so, so important to our spiritual growth and development to be in the word and listening um, to this, what the spirit's saying through the word. So wonderful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And thank you again for sharing your story, Angie. I I think that we're seeing a theme emerge in the guest interviews that we're doing is that God uses just the hardships, the trauma, the pain and suffering that we go through in life to transform us and to make us into who we are and, and to help others. And so I clearly see how God is doing that in your life. And I know with your background, having had the abuse as a teenager and then the traumatic car accident, you probably are still faced with triggers that you know bring up those past traumas. And I know you've developed a framework for dealing with that yourself and also teaching to other people. So if you could share with us. The- yeah, I would love to. I have a sometimes I do workshops or sometimes I teach live or sometimes I just talk about this in other places, but yeah, I, a trigger is a small thing that creates a large thing. Right. And in my life, what I recognize and people do different things, but I recognized, um, impatience and like yelling at or having angry words, especially for my children when they were pushing on my stuff. Cause I don't know if you ladies have children, but what I have learned is that children are the fastest way to push on the tender spots. <laughs> <laughs> my kids can feel, make me feel inadequate and uh, inferior faster than anything else. Right. And they don't mean to, of course, but they're just, I want to mother them. And I always have, my boys are older now, 18 and 13. I mean, I'm still their mother, but you know, especially in those younger years, uh, I wanted to mother them. So with, from a better place than I could see that I was. And Mm -hmm. uh, it was after a particularly difficult interaction with my boys when I had yelled at them and had such grief about doing that. I went upstairs to my closet and just began to pray. I need, I need something to change. I don't want Mm -hmm. to mother from this place. I don't want to Mm -hmm. feel like this all the time. And he, the Lord did not give me these five R's like with some kind of, you know, kapow (laughs) sort of thing. But over time, as I began to recognize that I was becoming more self-aware and I could put a stop to it, you know, I could withdraw, I could practice the pause. I could put a stop to it. I began to just put some language around it because I thought this is helping me and maybe it would help someone else. And so, yeah, so there are five R's and step one is called recognize. And the question that I ask in that is when anxiety rises, what does your body do? Right. Because mm-hmm. something happens. First Peter five, seven and eight says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. What does that happen when that anxiety is rising? Right. Because the enemy, when he, uh, sees anxiety, he's moving in for the kill, right? This is what's happening. And so for me, you know, I, my mind starts racing or my breath is a little bit, uh, like shallow or something, you know, it's quicker. My pace is quicker. Um, I get kind of like, um, feeling like I'm like hot or something, you know? And so I can, mm-hmm. I can tell something is happening. I'm in a circumstance, I'm in a conversation and I'm getting nervous. And so one step one is recognized. Yes, that is so good. You know, I um, relate to what you shared about the parenting and recognizing, you know, a time in life when 
I wasn't happy with how I was reacting and responding to my children. And it, it happened after my father passed. And I realized that what that triggered the grief was being expressed in anger. And I recognized this is, this is not me I've never had this type of anger before in these just short, uh, fuses, you know, and, um, and so it had me, like you said, dig deeper, what's really going on here. Um, and I love to the casting our cares, you know, that is so huge. Um, because we've got to, to trust that, God really does care for us. Um, when we believe he cares, then that stirs up our faith to cast the anxiety onto him. So um, that is yeah. just a beautiful way to, to begin this process. I, I've learned to think about the anxiety uh, as like emotional hunger. You know, mm -hmm. when I sit at my desk and I get hungry, you mm -hmm. know, I'm motivated to get up and get a cheese stick. Right. So I can keep working or something. Right. Like, I mean, right. this is, but when I get anxious, is that an, that's a spiritual hunger or what I need is a connection with the Lord. Like that yeah. is how we can do that's the casting, right. That when we cast our anxiety on him, can that be the invitation to say, wait a second, something is going on here and I'm on a slippery slope now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's Those steps. part of what Brooke and I uh, try to live out in our own life and teach other mm -hmm. women is how to recognize when your soul cup is yes. empty and, yes. you know, you need to tend to your own physical, emotional, spiritual needs so that you can be filled up. Yes. To spill out goodness yes. <laughs> to those around us. Yes. And the anxiety, you, you probably use this sometimes, but the HALTS acronym, I think is so important for me when I'm thinking about anxiety because the enemy is so present when we're vulnerable and the HALTS stands for hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or a spiritual mm. high. These mm. are the places that we're the most vulnerable, right? And so when True. some, when, when I, I mean, I, th I think those are at least good places that we're, you know, often vulnerable. And when in places of vulnerability, the enemy is like, Ooh, I can get her. Like, I just, you know, he doesn't mm. cause things to happen, but he certainly takes advantage of things that happen. So if we can remember, I think sometimes like, this is actually not about what's going on. We'll get to that in just a second, but this is about the fact that I'm lonely or I'm feeling tired emotionally physically, whatever, you know, um, mm -hmm. and be able to speak to that. Yeah. So, so step two is reveal. The second R is reveal. And the question that I ask is what am I believing on the inside about what's happening on the outside? And Brooke, you were just talking about this. Like, can I dig a little deeper? Um, mm -hmm. cause so often we want to say that the anxiety is because the kids or whatever, but actually the anxiety is about what the kids are pressing on that insecurity, <laughs> that tender spot. Sometimes I call it right. Um, for me, mm -hmm. I'm, uber sensitive to rejection and people not believing me or being misunderstood because of some of the pa things in my past. And so when, what are the kids doing so often that is like accentuating that or helping me believe that or taking me back to that? Um, mm -hmm. the, John 1, 5 says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Uh, when we can reveal the real thing that we're thinking about and mm -hmm. bring that to the light, then that darkness has to dissipate because they're not allowed to share space. Yes, exactly. And that's, I believe one of the things, you know, the Holy spirit is, is the great illuminator and yes. um, to reveal the things that are hidden, you know, that things can no longer stay hidden, then they don't have the same power over yes. us yes. to control us. But it takes, I think it takes a lot of courage to <laughs> ask those questions what reveal what's really going on here sometimes and i've felt it before i've been afraid i didn't want to really know sometimes you know um i don't know if you've experienced that or had other women have experienced that but not wanting to really know what was going on because that means that's going to be some other hard steps ahead to actually deal with the pain or the hurt or whatever the offense whatever it might be so is there anything you can speak to that for women who may be like knowing something's going on, but that kind yeah. of afraid to take that first step? 
I think sometimes we think that knowing the answer to that is going to be hard, but I just want to say not knowing the answer is hard too. And we mm-hmm. have to look at the, the, the result of, or the cause, the, what, what not knowing causes too. I'm not saying that very mm-hmm. well, but you know, there, there's, there's consequences for that as well. And this process of really being able to look at kind of the deep pain in my life, this did not happen overnight. I mean, this is a year's process of being dedicated to that. And there were times that it was really hard. And there were times when I felt like I was getting worse, not better. And that is true. Mm-hmm. That is true. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you, my family will say she's so much better to be around now. And I can trust her so much more Mm. because she says, I'm sorry. Or she says, this was actually about that. Or Mm -hmm. she says, I need a minute or I need to slow down this conversation. You know, I just know that I'm better inside, but I'm better to my people for having done this. You are worth it and they are worth it. I think Mm -hmm. that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. It is scary. Mm -hmm. It is scary, but we're working. Yeah. Kind of what you're saying is, um, I've heard this phrase used before, like choose your hard. Yeah. It's going to be hard to stay in this cycle and it's going to be hard to break out of that cycle, but which outcome do you ultimately want? And, and that helps motivate choosing. Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. So step three is remember. And the question I ask is where have I experienced God's faithfulness in previous circumstances? Psalm 145, 13 says the Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. Mm -hmm. And I always say, you know, I mean, I've heard this a lot of different times. The, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, right? And so where do we know God has shown up before, even in Mm. places or especially in places that we didn't think he was there at the time, right? I can remember this about the faithfulness of God in my life. I can remember this about the faithfulness of God in her life. I can remember this about the faithfulness of God in the Bible stories that I cherish, right? Mm -hmm. God is faithful and his character does not change. And if he promises that he's trustworthy, he is trustworthy. So where do we remember that and choose that rather than even just what we feel at the moment? Yeah, that's, that is wonderful. The power of testimony, Yes, just speaking out and testifying to God's faithfulness. And, and I like what you said, even if you're in a place to where you might be having a hard time seeing where God's been faithful in your own life, start looking for where he's faithful in other people's lives. And like you said, the Bible stories, because he is faithful and he's been faithful. And sometimes when we highlight that, just start seeing it. It allows us to be able to see in our own lives. Yeah. And he's not put off by the fact we don't feel it right now. I mean, I think it's one of the, you know, I I think it blesses him when we say, I don't see you right now, Mm -hmm. but I trust that you are here. I trust Mm -hmm. you are here because I remember, right? I remember Mm -hmm. what you say. And so I know that I'm going to stand right here in this and you are going to show yourself faithful. I believe that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I can say that I'm I'm particularly guilty of the spiritual amnesia of forgetting. Oh, our short-term memory is so bad when it comes to God. I mean, I was like, yes, or like you were just there yesterday, but today I'm not sure you're gonna be here, you know. And I think in the step-by-step method, that's one of the reasons we call out the lie, because so often mm-hmm. uh, the lie that we're believing is I'm not sure I can depend on you this time. And when mm-hmm. we say it out loud, you're like, based on what? Based on what have you ever let me down, you know? Um, And when we really poke at that, like you said, when we bring that to the light, it is a lie and we can reveal Mm -hmm. that and then walk forward in the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for me, the antidote to my spiritual amnesia is typically worship. Praise. Yes. Praise and just, uh, you know, that helps me to reconnect with Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the remember step is a really good, you you can have practical things. You can have a journal, you can mark spiritual markers in your life and write them down. You can have a playlist. You can have favorite scriptures that you go to, you know, what is your toolbox? Because remembering, you know, it's kind of like when you go to the store and you think, oh, I'm not going to take a list because I'm going to remember everything I'm going to need to make this recipe. And you get there and you're like, I don't remember what I need to, we need to write it down or record it or document it, you know, depending on your personality, what you like to do, how are you storing up treasures of his faithfulness today? So then in a day that's harder, you can go back and say, yes, 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 yes. I remember this now. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love that. Yes, so I do too. Of faithfulness. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, step four is receive. And the question I ask is how is God revealing his presence in this experience? John 14, 27 says, peace. I leave with you. My peace. I give you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The Lord promises us rest, joy, peace, hope, and abundance. That mm -hmm. is a promise. And so how do we posture ourselves to receive it? This is where we make the decision, right? It is ours to claim. And so how do we receive it? And I think, again, that can look differently, but this is a, this is a pause moment. This mm -hmm. is a breathing technique. This is a slowing down the conversation. This is being able to say, I need a minute. It's the John 15, five abide in me. I will abide in you. How do I reconnect? Cause right now my emotions are in a like whirlwind or a tailspin or so, you know, something like I'm going down, I'm going down. <laughs> uh, and so how do I say, no, I can connect to the source that then again, gives me the strength and lifts me back up. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Yeah. yeah. Opening up our eyes, isn't it? Yes. So yes. Yeah. It. Yeah. So the last step, step five is repeat. And the question is, how do I offer myself grace with this process? Lamentations mm -hmm. 3, 23 talks about, and 22 and 23 talk about how the Lord's um, faithfulness and mercies are new every morning. It says specifically because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And I always like to say, I take a little liberty and say his mercies are new every morning, but when we need him to be, his mercies are new every moment. And mm -hmm. we, we are strong and we are warriors and we are leaders and we are moms and we are professionals and we are wives and we are friends and we are daughters. And we have a lot of balls in the air and plates that we're spinning and we can do it all until we can't. And then, and then we're going to do this wrong. It's going to come out in ways we wish we hadn't. And then will we go back again to that source and say, I can learn from this. I can see what happened and I can learn from this so that I can shorten the gap. Uh, of reco recovery or whatever, you know? Um, and so how do we give ourselves grace as we're growing stronger? Mm -hmm. Yes. I love that you brought grace into this conversation because it's so important that um, we remember that grace isn't just unmerited favor, but it is actually an empowerment. It's an empowerment to overcome. I've heard it defined define this way is the empowerment to um, meet and overcome every evil tendency. So mm -hmm. every place where we have like weakness or a, a weak tendency towards sin or toward temptation or whatnot, like grace swoops in and brings us that empowerment to overcome. And so even when we have a, a day where, okay, we messed up, you know, the trigger got us. Okay. But I have access freely yeah. to the father's grace. And he's going to empower me and help me overcome. I can, I can try again. Yes. The mercies are there. <laughs> yes. And we can watch for patterns. That's been really helpful in my recovery or healing or mm. just growing stronger. You know, uh, when I know something is going to trigger me, I, it, my son played high school basketball all four years and his school had a great pep band. And the teacher that abused me was the band director and I was in band and pep band and all that stuff. And I'm like, how all these years oh, later, are they playing the same songs? How is this possible? <laughs> right. Uh, but you know, my husband and I got this little thing that we would look at each other. Cause he would know I wanted so much to be present there for my son, but the band and the activity over there and the, and the, all the music and stuff was hard. And I would sit sometimes at the games and I would just, the tears would just leak out of my eyes. And I felt like I had to leave or I'd get, you know, this hot. And I, you know, my husband and I started this little thing where he would look at me and smile and say, there's a band like in this, like little, like, you know, kid's voice almost. But what that did was I see you. I know this is hard. Take a deep breath. You can do this. You're in the right place. No one's going to hurt you here, you know? And so mm -hmm. I think too, in this like grace process or when it goes bad, let's say when it goes not the way we wanted it to go, what happened and how can I use that even to, to identify, okay, this is something that's real hard for me. So how do I take care of myself when I'm facing this kind of situation again? Wow. That's awesome. Oh, well, Angie, what you've been sharing is going to be super helpful for me as I talk to people about their brain ants. <laughs> and this is, um, it stands for automatic negative thoughts. In case uh, 
familiar with that. I know all, I don't know that <laughs> language, but I know that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I do have three daughters. They're all, let's see, 12, 15, and 18 now. And so I'm helping them through their formative years and mm. to tackle all the lies of the enemy and all the things that trigger, you know, not just the, the physical things like being hungry and angry and tired, but also just the the cognitive distortions that we have, mm -hmm. uh, from, you know, whatever from trauma or programming from society or bullying. Yeah. However, right. we end up with these distorted thoughts and they're just simply lies. Yeah. And so during my patient care, I'm always, you know, listening for the lies, uh, yeah. the pain ants that that are afflicting my patients and, and also with my children. And so this is a, a beautiful framework for mm -hmm. talking about that. And it's actually, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy is a technique in modern psychology to help people to do this in, in a secular fashion to, you know, identify the lie or the distortion and then, you know, hold it up to, the light. Of well, well, good. I'm glad it kind of matches. Like I'm not trained that way at all. I'm just simply someone that I'm like, I, th there's gotta be a better way. And so this is kind of the way that I've developed that works for me. So I'm glad to know it. It, is, <laughs> it, it jives. It was, early on in my, in my medical career, when I first came to faith, I, I just had this epiphany that God created cognitive behavioral therapy. He actually wired our brains to be able to to shift and, and transform and, and be renewed by replacing lies with the truth. And so thank you for giving us such a beautiful framework to think about that and, mm -hmm. and scripture to really anchor that in. Well, thank you for the opportunity to share. Yeah. Oh, it's delightful. Well, where can our listeners connect with you? Yeah, thank you. So the website is livesteadyon.com. And there at the top of that webpage, there's a tab that says, talk to your triggers. So if you want all these steps and scriptures, you can download, it's a free resource there. And the step-by-step -step masterclass, I'll send you a link for that as well, if you'd like, um, because I just love people, but the website's a great hub. Yeah. Anybody can find probably what they're looking for there. Okay. Super. Well, thank you so much, Angie. It was thank really you, fun. Angie. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Okay. Great. Bye for now.